Oh, hi, I didn't see you there. My name is Bliss Foster. Let's talk about what we actually want from Haute Couture. In order for this video to work, I really need to hear from everyone. I want to hear what you think. I read absolutely every comment that comes through. I want this to be a discussion. Let's move into it. So if you just look up Haute Couture, it seems like business is a booming. Haute Couture Fashion Week is held in Paris every January and July, and every time one happens, we get a hurricane of incredible stuff. But here's the deal. Haute Couture is a dying industry, and I'm a little afraid that we're going to lose it if we're not careful. And that would be a shame because, I mean, look at this stuff. Does it have a lot of practical purpose to it? I guess not, but there's lots of beautiful things that have minimal purpose. They're beautiful and they tell stories about culture, and, and to me, that seems like something that is worth preserving. We're gonna lay a little bit of informational groundwork and then we're gonna really dig into the question that we're trying to address here. So let's close all those other tabs, let's stop multitasking and come here with me. Come back, let's go. Haute Couture started, it could be argued, with Rose Bertin, who was the couturier for Marie Antoinette, the last queen of France before the French Revolution. All of these dresses were incredibly elaborate and so, so, so expensive. The really interesting thing about them was that many of them were being used to make political statements that the queen could not actually say out loud herself, and so she would communicate them through the way that she dressed. But of course, middle-class women all throughout the 18th and 19th century could not afford to have a couturier make all of their dresses, so they would adjust their own clothes or take them to a local dressmaker and have them modified to fit with fashions of the time. And that turned the custom dressmaking industry, couture, into a status symbol, and that status symbol was even higher if it was couture that came from France. In 1868, the Chambre Syndicale de la Haute Couture was born, and that's the arm of the French government that oversees Haute Couture as a business. It was originally made so that it could replace the system of guilds that weren't really serving the industry anymore. It was replacing the guilds and kind of unifying all the couturiers so that there could be some representation in government. Couture especially boomed during this period with Charles Frederick Worth, who was also one of the people that helped to found the Chambre Syndicale. And then it pretty much just continued to boom. World War II was a pretty big hiccup in it, but it didn't destroy the industry by any means. The place where it started to tilt downhill was in the 1960s. The first big nail in the coffin was when Balenciaga left his own house. He, he left and cheekily said that there was no one left to dress. Cristobal Balenciaga was a pretty funny smartass. I don't feel like he gets enough credit for that. As the next few decades continued, more and more haute couture houses were starting to lean towards bankruptcy and a, a bunch of them just went out of business altogether. I have a theory about why that happened, but I don't have any proof. So we're gonna briefly go over that theory with the qualification that these are just thoughts from Bliss his head and now there's no peer-reviewed research to back this up. Here's my theory. I think that before World War II, it was probably a common practice for most world leaders to use taxpayer money to pay for stuff like their wife to have a $100,000 dress. And then after World War II, there were just a lot of factors that made it where that just wasn't appropriate anymore, and it shouldn't be. Because it's like if you were getting $100,000 dresses on someone else's dime, and then they were like, no, you have to buy the $100,000 dresses, maybe you buy uh, a lot fewer $100,000 dresses. So a bunch of the couture houses were losing customers and many of them just went bankrupt. Again, that is a theory from Bliss. I have no evidence, but it makes sense to me. And now it's time to talk about Yves Saint Laurent, the goat, one of the goats. At least one of 10 significant goats. I don't know, probably top five. Dr. Eve invented ready to wear for the masses. Okay, quick uh, correction or at least a complication here. Um, if you look up the actual coverage of this event of ready to wear at the time in 1966, uh, what the New York Times said was Saint Laurent's desire to branch out and do his own ready to wear is not unique among the couturiers. Most of them have a ready to wear operation, however small, and nearly all of them design accessories or have given their names to a perfume or cosmetics. So maybe when we're talking about Yves Saint Laurent inventing Pret-a-Porter, maybe that just means that he was the first one to dedicate a whole store to it, whereas for most couturiers it was a very small operation. Sorry about that. Back to it. He was the first successful couturier to shift his business and make it where you could just buy clothes as is off the rack. That happened in 1966. So the ability to buy what many people thought of as luxury clothes, and it, it was luxury clothing, the ability to buy luxury clothing without having to do the massive expense of customizing a piece, that did nothing to help the haute couture industry. You may have heard of Bernard Arnault, who is the chairman and CEO of LVMH. He often goes back and forth with a couple of diff uh, Hi. Hello? Hey! Uh, I just wanted to let y'all know that this video has been sponsored by The Motherfucking Patreon I can't stop thinking about The Private Discord It's my favorite <laughs> Way to make fashion friends It's the thing Where I watch hours of exclusive content In the morning when I wake up And when I go to sleep at night 
I can't stop thinking about Bliss's life changing Patreon. It's phenomenal. Thanks, Isaac. Okay, okay, okay. But the best part is there's like there's like a whole bunch of people who love this. <laughs> like tons of people. Anyway. Okay, 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 we're good. Okay, bye. Support the motherfucking Patreon. <laughs> All right, cool. You may have heard of Bernard Arnault. He's the chairman and CEO of LVMH, which is the largest luxury conglomerate in the world. He goes back and forth with a few other men for being the richest man in the world. He made his vast fortune by um, having a rich dad, but then also by buying up dying luxury brands, revitalizing them and making them just massively profitable. This includes some of the most recognizable brands in the world like Loewe, Givenchy, Dior, Bulgari, Fendi. There's a bunch. They own like Tiffany and Sephora and Fenty now. There's a lot of them. But let's take Dior for example. In 1984, Arnaud secured $80 million to purchase uh, Moussac saint Fire. It was a bankrupt textile company that also happened to own Christian Dior. He got rid of the textile part of it and just kept Dior. So even before Christian Dior had even turned a profit as a company, Arnaud wanted to bring back haute couture in a huge way. Why the fuck would he do that? I mean, just for some context here about haute couture as an industry, between 1950 and today, the number of haute couture clients in the world has decreased from 200,000 in 1950, there were 200,000 customers of Haute Couture. Okay, so today there are 200. Total. When I say Haute Couture is unprofitable, I mean it is extremely unprofitable. It is the most unprofitable. Why would Arnaud, a guy who is notoriously, ferociously focused on business and the bottom line, why would Arnaud spend millions of dollars on a part of the market that total has just a few hundred customers. Why spend the money on something that probably won't sell at all? Bernard Arnault introduced this idea that haute couture will be used as an advertisement. Haute couture shows exist to promote perfumes and cosmetics and small leather goods that fans of the house could buy into at a price point that was achievable. So a multi-million dollar Dior show, like the crazy, the, the excessive presentations that were famously occurring under John Galliano's tenure at Couture, those could be effective at generating profits in consumer purchases of more approachable and affordable goods. Arnaud thinks that Dior should be showing Haute Couture and should have a sizable budget to do so, even though it might seem useless for selling the Haute Couture itself. Okay, so to recap, Haute Couture is wonderful. Everybody likes Haute Couture. We're all retweeting stuff about Haute Couture. We like it a lot. Haute Couture is essentially an advertisement for the brand at large. And one of the things about advertising is that it's kind of like a movie set. You can sort of take shortcuts in certain ways. There's a lot of haute couture houses that just don't put buttonholes on the jackets or some of the dresses that they're finishing. They, they fake it using snaps. They'll just like put a snap piece here and then put a snap piece here, put the thing over, and then they'll fake sew on buttons to make it look like it's been buttoned up when really they just didn't have time to add in buttonholes. You know why they do that? Because they're really crunched for time and they're probably busy doing the most intricate beating work that mankind has ever produced. Even among the houses that have the absolute highest standards of quality, there are lots of shortcuts that have to be taken in order to just complete the stuff in time. So then we get to stuff like a, a recent example, Jean-Paul Gaultier Haute Couture by Olivier Roosting, which had visible signs of a lack of completion. Callum Knight, who's the creative director of Show Studio and a, a really smart dude, he had some fairly harsh words after he went to that show. You need time, like this isn't a thing. Couture isn't a machine. You need to learn to work with your petty man. You need to train your team. You need to work with them. Whereas the Gautier team are now in a situation where they're rehashing ideas that they've had for years under a new creative director who hasn't worked with them and they don't have the relationships with. And that was a problem today because lots of this collection was safety pinned. And you could see it very evidently from the third row where we were sitting. Lots of shoulder pads safety pinned on, dresses safety pinned at the back, safety pinned at the boob to stop things falling off. This is supposed to be the height of dressmaking and to a point where you can have any fit in the world. And you know, we had Balenciaga this morning and the precision in that is what makes it amazing and what makes it worthwhile and the reason that we all come here and I'm not getting on my high horse, however, I think it's really problematic that we have a brand that is putting marketing before a craft that only 10 houses in the world can have. Is this a bad thing? Okay, wait, hey, hey, 
We're returning to the, the core of the video here. This is the thesis. So come, come back and stay with me. Come on, no new tabs. What do we want from Haute Couture? I mean, you and me are not buying this. We're kind of lucky that it exists in the first place. It's, it is essentially just an advertisement. What, what do we want this advertisement to actually be? On one hand, Haute Couture is really one of the only ways that we can continue a very long tradition of excellence, precision, and artisanal techniques in fashion. On the other hand, it's just about generating hype. So why not use safety pins? Really, like, who cares? As long as people are tweeting about it, the box has been checked. It's been an effective advertisement and it's further justification to keep Haute Couture around for another season. But there's, okay, to kind of wind this back a little bit because I, I've taken multiple sides on this before. I am very much, everyone knows this, I am very much in love with technique and super high-end textile. I think that stuff is wonderful. It's so, so cool. I've also made a video about Pierre Moss's bid for Couture. So there, there is a little bit of nuance to what I'm saying here. I mean, if, if you really want to know what that video was about, you can go check it out. This is a really controversial show, and I feel like I had a pretty different opinion than most other people did on it. But all that to say, this is not me just sitting here, you know, lecturing everybody about how like, oh, things aren't like they used to be, like stuff was better in the past when Balenciaga was in charge. But I, I want us to sit here for a second and listen to this quote by Fran Lebowitz, who's a, uh, uh, <laughs> a professional smartass. I don't, I don't really know what Fran Lebowitz is. She's a really good writer. Fran Lebowitz is a writer. But she had a, a really good quote about, um, well, I'm just gonna let you watch it. Everyone talks about the uh, effect that AIDS had on the culture in the sense, I mean, people don't talk about it anymore, but when people did talk about it, uh, they talked about like what artists were lost, but they never talked about this audience that was lost. Uh, you know, when people talk about like, why, you know, the, why was New York City Ballet so great? Well, I mean, it was because of Balanchine and Jerry Robbins and people like that, but also that audience was so, I, I can't even think of the word. I mean, it, Suzanne Farrell went like this instead of this. That was it, she, could, she might as well just kill herself. There would be like a billion people who know exactly every single thing. You know, there was a, such a high level of connoisseurship of everything that, 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 that people like this were interested in, you know, of everything that made the culture better. You, can, you know, a very discerning audience, a very, you know, uh, an audience with a high level of connoisseurship um, is as important to the culture as artists. So, I, I don't know. I think as an audience, we might need to be a little bit more discerning. Because again, I, I, I don't feel like probably anyone watching right now is one of those couture clients. And I mean, just, just in case, if you are someone who is able to afford haute couture, I strongly encourage you to branch out beyond Chanel. Chanel makes beautiful work. There is no doubt at all about the level of quality that Chanel puts out in their haute couture. But there are a lot of options out there that are doing really interesting stuff. And I would encourage you to at least go and check those things out. If you want to be the first one to start wearing something that's really unique and mega high quality and has a great story behind it, you should check out Artisai. I did an interview with the designer at the label for my first Paris Fashion Week trip. She does an outstanding job. But yeah, I, I do encourage you to go go look at other options besides the, the single only status symbol company in the entire Haute Couture schedule. There, there are other options and many of them are incredible. But for the rest of us, for everybody else, if you're going to take something from an Haute Couture show and then post it online, start being inquisitive about it. Post it onto Instagram and start asking, what is the technique that's used to make the skirt like this? What is this fabric? Why do they use fabric like that? Start commenting on brands' pages and asking them for information about the stuff. Tell them that you want to know more about the specifics of these beautiful pieces. If there's a way for us to demonstrate that we care about a certain element of this advertisement, then that will likely be the type of advertisements we get in the future. And maybe it's just that you don't care about it. And if it doesn't resonate with you, that's all good. But for those of us who really love the technique side of haute couture, the, the high dressmaking part of it, I think we need to be a little bit more of a vocal and discerning audience about what we're taking in and how we're taking it in. And that's it. Go do what my brother said, join the Patreon. It's the only way this channel is able to support and you get to join an incredible community of really smart, plugged in fashion people. If you're like me and you don't have many friends IRL who are into fashion, this is a really great community to be able to just start conversations with people about clothes you really love.
You should check it out. It's like a massive fashion friends group chat. I really do wanna know what everybody has to say about this. I want to hear your responses. I read every single comment, so go comment. And uh, yeah, I love you a lot. I'll talk to you later. See ya. We remind you that Yves Saint Laurent was fired from Dior in 1960 for a couture leather jacket inspired by the Beatniks. That's what I was thinking of. That's hilarious. That like, he puts a thing on the runway, what, whoever the boss was that cared so deeply about this issue was not around enough for the six months that he was spending being like, mm, the leather jacket does not look quite right, let's change it like this. And no one at the Couturier, I'm sure, was just kind of like, Mr. Laurent, are you sure we can do that? I feel like maybe you yeah. should run this by the boss. And then he just like puts it out and the boss, who has been where for the last six months, is just like, you better get up to my office right now, Eve. What?